My name is Katie Brito. I'm the Director of Drug and Health Screening Solutions at Hyrite, and I will be your moderator for today's session. Um, before we get started, Hyrite prepared this presentation for informational purposes only, and it is not intended to be substituted for legal advice. Should you have any legal questions, please direct them to your legal counsel. Before we begin, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. We will not be providing copies of today's slides. However, we will send you an email tomorrow with a link to the recorded webinar session that you can share with your team. If you are experiencing any audio or visual issues, please refresh the browser window by clicking F5 on your keyboard or let us know through the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. We will take questions at the conclusion of the webinar today. Um, to uh, request or to ask questions, type your question in the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. We're going to try to get to all of um, the questions and answers during today's um, presentation. But if we have to provide um, more detailed answers or run out of time, we will answer your questions in a later email. Um, after today's presentation, we would really appreciate it if you guys do complete our short survey. Let us know if this session was valuable to you and if you have any ideas for future topics. I get the pleasure of introducing our speaker for today, someone that I've worked with for a very long time. Um, uh, our host is Dr. Todd Simo. He's Hyrite's Chief Medical Officer. You can review Dr. Simo's bio in the speaker folder and we encourage you to follow him on Twitter. I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Simo to get started. Well, thank you very much, Katie. You can tell by the way she introduced me, we have a very close relationship here and have worked together for a long period of time. So from this perspective, you know, what I wanted to do, you know, from an agenda perspective is really go through who is a medical review officer. And to a certain extent here, I put, you know, the Wizard of Oz icon on here because the, to many times the medical review officer is just the person that you hear over the phone, you know, with a booming voice that says Joe Blow is positive for cocaine. But I want to really, you know, remove that and really go to the person, you know, behind the, you know, the, behind the curtain. So who that person is, the administrative functions that we handle, as well as, you know, the review of non-negative results. And, and I'll actually put in two mock interviews so you can actually hear an MRO interview since most people, you know, never get the pleasure of going through that type of interview when they have a drug screen. And then the last topic I want to cover are what the MRO interview really cannot accomplish. So, you know, a lot of times there's, there's thoughts out there that says the MRO interview can determine impairment. And I want to go through some of the, you know, things that just can't happen during that interview. So who can be a medical review officer? So all of this is based upon the Department of Human Health Services, you know, guidelines as part of the federal drug uh, federal workplace drug screening program. So a medical review officer is a licensed physician either a doctor of medicine or a doctor of osteopathy, you know, who is knowledgeable about pharmacology and toxicology of illicit drugs, has been trained in, in knowing what the collection process, how it happens, what's supposed to happen, can interpret the results that are reported from the lab, is aware of all the administrative functions that need to happen in regards to, you know, verifying, um, matching up results, the chain of custody, reporting results, as well as record retention of those results. And, you know, to become a medical review officer, every five years I have to go through training as well as pass a recertification test. So, you know, from a medical review officer perspective, that human and health services MRO has, you know, th you know three major groups that, that deal with them. Number one is uh, DOT. So, you know, U.S. Uh, Department of Transportation, uh, all of those literally millions of employees, you know, that go through drug screening have to have an MRO in, uh, involved in their screening. 
you know, part of the Department of Energy, the Nuclear Reg Regulatory Commission. Again, all of those people, you know, have an MRO involved in all of their drug tests, both positive and negative. And there's many states that require MRO review on positive results. There's also some states like New York that require MRO review on both positive and negative results. So these are the kind of entities or agencies that really depend upon that, that medical review officer. So the administra administrative functions of a uh, medical review officer is really to be an independent and partial gatekeeper and an advocate of accuracy. So even though we were an agent of the company and we're not the doctor or the advocate of the donor, we really are, you know, established no doctor-patient relationship with that donor. Uh, what we do is essentially, you know, review those results that come in, match up the chain of custody to those results, provide that oversight, as well as correct any issues that come up with the collection process, within the lab testing process, and we ensure the timely flow of results to you all as the employer. And during this whole period of time, we need to protect the confidentiality of that drug screening information. So to continue with the basic duties, you know, you know, the job when that laboratory result comes in is to review the copy two. And the copy two is the, the uh, part of the chain of custody that the donor and collector have signed that, uh, you know, affirms that this is that donor specimen. And make sure that, you know, any administrative errors, you know, the temperature box wasn't checked, the collector forgot to say, uh, sign their name, the donor forgot to sign her name. We go through and, and correct those errors to make sure that that chain of custody can stand up to regulatory and legal scrutiny. Um, you know, if it's negative, we should assure that all the information on that chain of custody is consistent with the laboratory result, and then we report it. Um, you know, staff under my direct supervision may, you know, do many of this administrative functions, but they really can't handle any non-negative results. And the next part of this thing is really the, the meat of the MRO practice, and that's the review of laboratory non-negative results. So from this perspective, again, acting as an agent of the employer, you know, the medical review officer reviews that non-negative, that pot laboratory positive result with the donor to find out if the donor has a legitimate, verifiable medical explanation for the result. You know, uh, the burden of proof here is on the donor. So, you know, the, if the donor alleges something, the donor has to be able to provide that proof in, in the way that's, that the MRO wants it and, and in a way that it is verifiable. So, you know, donors alleging, oh, yeah, I used an old prescription from five years ago that I no longer have, no longer can get any records of, and my physician is, uh, has died since that period of time, you know, that cannot be used since it's not verifiable in regards to that allegation. And if the donor does have a verified, you know, verifiable, legitimate medical explanation for the result, the MRO then is bound to downgrade that result, make that pot laboratory positive into a verified negative result. If there is no verifiable medical explanation for it, uh, then the MRO is bound to, you know, verify it as positive and re report it as such to the company. So, the, you know, the steps of the interview process really it, to begin with is the, when you call up the donor, the first job is to say that you are the medical review officer and explain uh, to them why you're calling, confirm the identity of that donor, briefly educate the donor about the actual process, then offer the donor the opportunity to present the medical explanation, and then obtain verifiable proof of that explanation if it exists. And then tell the donor the final MRO verified result. So you can't gather all the information and go, okay, well, you know, I'll report this to the company and they'll let you know. No, part of the process is to tell the donor that the test is verified positive, the test will be verified negative, the test will be canceled for some reason, or the test is determined as a refusal to test. 
that's the MRO's responsibility during the process is to actually tell them the final result. So if you have donors coming back saying, hey, the MRO didn't tell me what happened, yeah, in all likelihood that, that donor's lying because that's an integral part of the medical review process. But the last part is really, you know, when they have employment questions, am I going to get fired? Are they not going to hire me? What's going to happen to me? All of those things are really referred back to you as the employer because it's your drug-free workplace policy uh, that really takes effect here. So if you offer rehabilitation on a first positive, that's up to you all. If you don't and you immediately terminate for cause, again, that's up to you all and your drug-free workplace policy. So what I found, you know, uh, found that may be uh, interesting to everybody since, you know, many people have never gone through the medical review in, interview is actually to do a mock interview. So, so Katie will be assisting me here. So I'll be, I'm calling Katie right now. Hello, this is, hello, this is Katie. Hello, Katie. You know, this is Dr. Simo. I'm the medical review officer uh, for a company that you recently did a drug screen for. I got to talk to you about that drug screen result. So, so can you verify your identity by giving me your ID numbers that appeared on the chain of custody? 556-320. Five, five, Perfect. Now that I confirmed your identity, but before giving your result, I do have to tell you one standard statement, and that statement is that even though I'm a doctor, I'm not establishing any kind of doctor-patient relationship. I'm acting as an agent of the company to discuss a drug screen result with you. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. Well, your drug screen was positive for the evidence of cocaine, so my job here is to find out if you have a medical explanation for this. So are you on any prescription medications? I'm on Xanax. Okay. And within one week prior to the collection of this drug screen, were you involved in any kind of medical or surgical procedures? No, but I do eat a lot of sesame seeds on Whoppers. Okay, great. Well, since Xanax or sesame seeds don't account for this result, I have to verify this is a positive screen, and the company that requested the screen will take action on it according to their employment practices. If you have any questions of what those practices are, you know, please contact that employer. And that's really where that interview gets, gets terminated at that point in time. Uh, if the donor does have questions, I will answer them. Uh, many times the questions will be that I, you know, read something on the Internet that sesame seeds cause positive drug screens, and I'll see, say, well, even if that does appear in the Internet, that's wrong, it doesn't. So, again, it's verified positive, and if you have any questions what your, you know, employer does, please contact them. So the next mock interview here, I'll be calling to, uh, Katie once again. Hi, this is Katie. Hi, Katie. This is Dr. Simo. I'm the medical review officer for the drug screening administrator of your recent test result. Do need to speak to you in regards to that result. So before I give your result, can you just verify your identity by giving me uh, your, you know, ID number as it appeared on the drug screen collection form? 556-320. Five, five, Perfect. Uh, now that I've verified your identity and before giving you a result, do I have to tell you one standard statement? And that statement is that even though I'm a doctor, I'm not establishing any kind of doctor-patient relationship. I'm acting as an agent of the company to discuss a drug screen result with you. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. So your recent drug screen was positive for amphetamine. So my job here is to find out if you have a medical explanation for this. So are you on any prescription medications? I am on Adderall for ADD. Well, perfect. Well, Adderall certainly will account for this result. So that being said, I need to get verifiable proof of that Adderall prescription. So what pharmacy do you get your Adderall filled at? I, I use Charlotte Drug. Perfect. And what's Charlotte Drug's telephone number? 555-1212. Great. So once I hang up here, I'm going to call the pharmacy, verify that prescription, and once I verify the prescription, I will be reporting this to the company as a negative drug screen. So that really terminates that process. I tell them that if I verify it, I'm going to make it negative. That's the process that we go through literally hundreds of times a day here. So that's really two mock interviews uh, as it relates to, you know, the MRO process. 
So the last part of the presentation here, I do want to go through is really, you know, weaknesses in, in the MRO interview. So things that we, you know, can't accomplish as medical review officers. So the ver first bullet point here is the MRO cannot judge a donor's level of impairment at the time of collection. So um, when you look at this, the level in urine and the level in hair tests really mean nothing in regards to recent drug use. You know, the windows of detection are very broad in both cases. You know, for urine, it's basic detection within the past week. Uh, for hair testing, it, it's within the last 90 days. So from those two specimens, that level can be, you know, 108,000 for cocaine. And there's no way that I can say at the time, you know, of the drug screen that that donor was impaired. I can say that the donor doesn't have a medical explanation for the result, that the use of cocaine can be impairing, but I can't say that the donor at the time of collection, based upon the level, um, you know, w was impaired. And I'll give a, a instance where you know, how amenable levels are, especially in, in urine. So, you know, there was a drug screening donor that uh, went to a collection site, urinated in the cup. Uh, after urinating the cup, um, the, the gentleman decided that he wanted to put a big rock in the, in the cup uh, to, to somehow think that the rock was going to absorb drugs or break the drug screening equipment or something. But when he presented the cup to the collector, the collector noticed the large rock there, asked how it got there, and the guy said, well, I peed it out, which the rock was so large that wouldn't be possible. So the, you know, the collector then said, well, based upon regulation, I have to do an immediate restream with observation. The donor complied. The donor waited around, and about 45 minutes later, uh, uh, provided another specimen, this time without a rock in it. You know, by regulation in this particular event, uh, the collector is supposed to uh, send both specimens to the laboratory for analysis. And the MRO then gets to determine which result is reportable to the company, if one's negative and one's positive, or one is substituted and the other one is, is negative. The MRO gets to decide which, which result is actually reportable by regulation. But that being said, both results came back and both results were reviewed by me. The, both results were positive for methamphetamine. The first specimen uh, that was collected initially that had the rock in it had a, uh, had a level of around 1,500 nanograms per milliliter. The second specimen collected 45 minutes later had a level of 500 nanograms per milliliter. Therefore, within less than an hour, the level changed and was diluted out three times. So from that perspective, that level means nothing because there's a variety of uh, just donor hydration that can impact what the level is markedly in, in, in these situations. So therefore, you really can't use that level to determine impairment. Now with oral fluid testing and the actual narrow window of of detection, uh, there could be some ways that you can use that to say potential impairment, especially with marijuana. The detection window in oral fluid is less than 24 hours. There's studies out there that says marijuana is impairing not only when you're high, but when you're coming off that high. So therefore, the window of detection of marijuana and the oral fluid detection range actually overlaps. So with a, a marijuana positive in oral fluid, I could state to a high degree of medical probability that, that a donor is impaired during the time of collection. Otherwise, for other drugs, it's, it's very difficult because the impairment window is much smaller than the actual detection window. The next part of this is, is the MRO cannot tell if a person is using his or her prescription medication as indicated or prescribed. So from this perspective, I periodically get calls from employers that say, hey, we know that, you know, John Smith here is on, you know, OxyContin, and we just want to make sure that he's not overusing it since he's the overhead crane operator in the ammunition plant. And uh, his doctor says that he is safe to work there, so we already have that, but we don't want him using too much. So can you use the levels to tell us if he's using that drug appropriately? And the answer is really no. 
because, again, that level is very amenable to different factors. It's amenable to the time that he uses the medicine, so he you know, has to use it about every 12 hours if he uses it an hour before and then 13 hours after. All of a sudden, you're looking at the, the, those levels in urine can markedly change. His hydration uh, level can change. How much food he ingested can change the absorption. So, so there's all sorts of things that make that lo level vastly vary, you know, in the urine and therefore, you know, urine drug screening and, and, you know, even oral fluid drug screening really aren't going to give a good sense of if he's using his medication as prescribed. All I can tell you is, yep, it was positive for it. Yep, he has a medical explanation that compelled me to downgrade it. Yes, there's a safety concern, but there's no way for me to say, yeah, he's using double the dose he's supposed to. And the last uh, thing is the MRO interview does not determine prescription drug use or depend, you know, drug abuse or dependence. So I always use, you know, the case uh, of Rush Limbaugh here. You know, Mr. Limbaugh had a well-known and documented case where he was getting prescription medications from five different doctors, all of them for oxycodone. And uh, during this, this time, if he had a drug screen, you know, all he would have to do is present one of those five cases. And there's no way, you know, based upon how all of these databases are rolled up that I could come out and find out he had four other doctors prescribing them to him. So therefore, he would have a legitimate and verifiable medical explanation for the result, which would then compel me to downgrade the result. I may elaborate a safety concern to, to you all as the employer saying he's on a medication that could impact his ability to work safely. But again, I have no way to determine that he was abusing oxycodone or was being overprescribed oxycodone because he was drug seeking during that period of time. So from that perspective, there's no, really no way for, for me to help you all out to say, hey, this guy is a prescription drug abuser. So those are really weaknesses in the MRO process and things that the MRO process really doesn't uh, handle. So coming soon, we're, we are sending out uh, you know, quarterly podcasts. Uh, I'm, going to have a podcast published on November 13th. That uh, podcast is actually about uh, the best specimen for your company and what we've called these podcasts is MRO Talks. So from this perspective, you know, I have this, you know, gentleman up in the upper left-hand corner of the slide saying, we're done. Any questions? So I'll turn it over to Katie to, to you know, go through some questions. Yep. We've got quite a few of them, actually. Um, first one, how do you handle split specimen requests? So split specimen request. So part of the DOT program is every donor is is given the opportunity uh, by the MRO to have the split specimen tested. As a normal co course of business here at Higher Right, every urine specimen uh, that we review, we also offer the opportunity to have the donor have the, the specimen retested. Uh, for oral fluid and hair specimens, um, since these are non-regulated, there isn't a mandate to have, you know, have a split specimen or to have the original specimen retested. We don't offer that opportunity. Now, if you are an employer in a state that says, hey, if you're going to take punitive action, you have to tell the donor that they can have the specimen retested at their expense. That's really your obligation in any of the cases, whether or not we're, we're offering it or not. But, but in urine, what ends up happening at the end of the interview, I would say, now the only way that you can contest this result is by requesting, uh, you know, the split specimen tests or a portion of your original sample to be sent to another laboratory. If you would like that, you know, please give us a call back. So we, it is offered as a standard course of business on all DOT tests, and it is offered in the standard course of business on all urine tests, whether it's DOT or non-DOT. Next question, Katie. Yep. So what if um, a donor has a prescription that's very old, or what if you cannot verify um, with the pharmacy? So if all of a sudden there's a, a old prescription, so if a person, you call them up and they're positive for, you know, opiates happens quite a bit here. Um, so they're positive for morphine and they go, oh, yeah, I had a morphine prescription. And they'll say, but it was old. A lot of times you have to define what old is. Periodically old to the donor means three months. 
um, sometimes old means five years old. So from that perspective, if the prescription was within the last calendar year, we'll actually use the information from the pharmacy. So if the guy's able to say, hey, you know, I had morphine tablets, I used them periodically, and I used one, you know, prior to the drug screen, you know, if that prescription is within the last rolling 12 months, that, you know, we can go ahead and use that pharmacy information. If the prescription's older than 12 months in a normal course of business, we give the donor two opportunities. Number one, if they have the prescription bottle still, and many of them do, they can actually take pictures of the prescription bottle and we can then verify that prescription with the pharmacy. And even though it's, you know, two years old or three years old, we can see that there's still, you know, still medication in the bottle, and therefore, you know, you know that can be the verifiable proof of it. You know, more, you know, quite often we'll talk to a guy who's positive for morphine, and I'll say, oh, yeah, I used my last pill. Well, do you still have the prescription bottle? Oh, no. How old is it? Three years old. So they just happened to use their last pill the week prior to their drug screen, and then they threw away the bottle. So from that perspective, what we'll do is, well, you have to go back to your treating physician um, and, and get them to say, hey, they're aware that you're continuing to use this old prescription of morphine, and they condone that use. So we can get proof from their, their doctor they can do that. Now, we get periodically, oh, yeah, I used a morphine, and it's three years old. Can you get proof from your, you know, uh, you know proof from, oh, no, can't get proof, don't have the bottle, can't get a letter. Well, in those cases, we don't have verifiable proof and therefore have to verify that as a positive drug screen. Next question, Katie. And, well, and what if um, you contact the pharmacy um, that the donor has provided and you find that, the pharmacy does not have a verifiable. Does does the MRO call the um, donor back, or does the MROA team call the donor back? How is that handled? Yeah, what what ends up happening if we call up the pharmacy and the pharmacy goes, hey, we don't know Katie, you know. So in the the example I used, Katie had an Adderall prescription, and we call up that pharmacy and go, hey, is this Katie's you know prescription? And part of that process, we do have you know Katie's ID number. I often do get the actual RX number from the bottle. I didn't go. Th- through that part in the mock interview. And if they say, yeah, that doesn't exist, that Katie's never been here, we'll actually call up the donor and say, hey, that pharmacy didn't work, and here's ways that you can provide us verifiable proof. And then you have, you know, 48 hours to get this to us, so we'll give them kind of a drop-dead time. If uh, that Katie went away, never got back to us, we're going to verify that as positive because the person alleged a medical explanation that couldn't be verified. So if they get back to us, sometimes it's because, oh, yeah, that's not the pharmacy I got that filled at. I I used this other pharmacy, and, and we'll work with the donor to try to get proof. I mean, the motivation here is to provide fair play. And, you know, periodically people, you know, make a mistake and don't remember the pharmacy that they use or they routinely use one pharmacy, but in this case they used another. You know, we'll try to work with the donor to do that in a reasonable manner, but we don't give the donor forever to provide us this information. You know, we generally give them short uh, windows of time. We can provide, give the donor from a regulatory perspective, if it was a DOT or a federal test, up to five days. We tend to give them shorter windows than five days if they call up and need an extension if it's within that five days we'll provide it to them but again uh, if we can't verify it with the pharmacy or can't get verifiable proof of it in any way then we're going to make this a positive screen great there's just one more question we have time for Um, are there any non-negative results that do not require an MRO follow-up that nothing on the market would show a positive for that particular drug So, you know, there are, you know, when you all of a sudden look at heroin and PCP, both of those are Schedule I drugs um, that have no medical explanation. Um, You know, the the MRO interview does take place if it's a federal program. Uh, It does take place, and, and, and in terms of the best practices, the MRO interview still takes place. Part of that interview is just to allow the donor kind of, you know, fair play, even though they're not going to have a medical explanation. You still go through the, you know, uh, the interview, and it tends to make everything run smoother through, because then when they say, oh, yeah, I went to the Middle East, and they injected 
treated me with all these drugs and then I came back home, you know, you can basically say, hey, it's still a Schedule One drug. You're not going to have proof of this. Sorry, you got to verify it as positive. And the company will take action on it. So, so MRO interview does occur even with those drugs that don't have a medical explanation is part of a best practice. And they have to occur in those state, in those states and in those federal agencies regardless if there's not going to be a, a medical explanation because that's just how the regulation is set up. Great. Thank you, Dr. Simo. This concludes our presentation for today. We appreciate all of your time. Have a great day. Thank you very much.